like boobies. You like boobies. Vicky likes boobies. You're tacky and I hate you. Now, are there any damn questions? Have you any idea what the street value of this mountain is? nice fish you know big fucking eyes but a nice fucking fish I guess, mate, welcome. I, I'm, I'm Mike and I'm Justin and uh, we have issues of comics that we've read recently and we're gonna talk about them Okay, you you sent me that directly. It wasn't through the group. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. What? That was... There we go. I wasn't sure if we were going to talk about... If we are going to go directly into the podcast or talk about the thing we're writing. Oh, yeah. I didn't even get a chance to fucking look through the rest of it. Okay. But I will tomorrow morning, and then I'll shoot you a text with notes. So, yeah. We've been... But yeah. It's been a while since we've talked comics as a show. We do it on a regular basis, but we don't let you folks know about it. Uh, we have three core series. I don't know if I say series. Three core... Uh, I can't just say... We're going to talk X-Men. Yeah. We're going to talk Spider-Man. And we're going to talk Avengers. Yeah. Not in that order. Because uh, if we're going to build up to what I find most interesting... I think we should start with the Avengers. Okay. Because cool. it hasn't exactly been an off year, or so, but it hasn't been as interesting as the other stuff. No. Uh, I feel like they've kind of like hit the rut ever since they started chilling out inside of a fucking hollowed out dead celestial. Well, that ended, which was... Well, yeah, but we were saying in the overall, like, it, it's been a year of, like, yeah. and nothing too big. And I think since they did that is the last time, I think, not that they were, I'm not, uh, lack of sleep means lack of words, but, mm-hmm. like, nothing that huge is going on, I think. It crescendoed during Avengers Forever, but the yeah. problem with that is... That wasn't a quick crescendo. That wasn't like a 12-part story that comes out every month. No, that was another classic uh, big two story where it's a year-long extravaganza with intersecting elements in multiple other books. Yeah. Because there was the Avengers Forever series that I believe it was almost it was like two years unless they were really cranking them out there. Because that got up to like 20-something issues. Yeah. And I'm not saying it meandered, but it covered a lot of different ground. There was some issues that could have been tightened up. and It was, in a lot of ways, a character study. And not just about one character. It was... There was a lot of variance. To break down the concept of what was going on. And it's a thing that the biggest hang up I have about what happens in all of these, uh, these company stories, there's always a new place that is the most important place in all of the multiverse. Yeah. It's constantly shifting. And this was the God quarry. This was a, a dimension where all of the bodies of powerful beings created kind of a wall to block off or a, uh, a crust because everything was supposed to come from underneath it was to a block layer. off a shield, uh, if you will. Yeah, it, a shield might be a, good <laughs> a kind of planet shaped shield almost to block off pure destruction for the multiverse. Just like, all right, that's a giant threat that deserves a giant threat assessment team. And it had the the ultimate Avengers Tower essentially there. Like, the, I don't even remember exactly what it was called, but it was. It was a watchtower where the the prime Avenger, they called it, hang out. I would hang out. And that's 
we'll get to that big reveal at the end. But most of this series was spent. Yeah. That was kind of, it's one of those things where you're like, whoa, who's it going to be? Who's going to be? And when it finally comes down to who it was, you're like, oh, yeah, it kind of makes sense. Yeah. 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 Because it's not the version of this character we're used to. Yeah. But in the overarching Avengers lore, they are a very important character. Uh, the, th- the thing I was getting to, though, it's a character study in that it had a lot of variants. If you're watching MCU stuff, you understand the concept of variants of a lot of different characters. We saw an Ant-Man Tony Stark. We saw uh, The Thing, but he was a star brand, I think. Or yeah, he was like a was. Uh We had... A fucked up vision, a vision that was almost like there was almost nothing left to him. And we had like 10 different versions of Steve. Yeah. A few issues. I think that was the most interesting stuff. Be- okay, the three most interesting things for me were uh, Robbie Ray is being elevated to possibly the most important Ghost Rider ever. Yeah. Uh, maybe even four things. Uh, the new. Star Brand, who was a baby when she was first introduced, and every time she used yeah. her powers, yeah, just kept aging up. Kind of a reverse version of uh, was it Demon Girl in Invincible? Yeah, yeah. And they were being overprotective of her, which is it was kind of great as the story went on because all these people, the Avengers, the core Avengers group, saw her as a baby, saw her mother sacrifice herself to have this kid born. And then she's rapidly aging, so they all have to come to grips with the fact that they can't stop her from using her powers. She's kind of destined to use her powers to save the day, but they're going to have to watch her die, watch her sacrifice herself. And she hasn't even really lived a life. She kind of, it's a mayfly kind of thing. Yeah. She maybe gets a year. Uh, there's that element. And then there's the Steve part. As, as all Steve Rogers is, is are... They're all pretty selfless guys that are taken from the multiverse, and most of them don't really have the skills to get it done. But they're put through the training anyway. Most of them don't have the skills except for the Wolverine slash Nuke slash Steve Rogers, who's got all of the problems of all three of those characters together and is very reticent of getting involved. Uh, that was a pretty cool issue where they're training all the Steves and young skinny never got the serum Steve and overweight. Uh, I don't even remember what he did. Was he a, the comic book artist? Was he bad Steve? Bad Steve. Where they have to pull the worthiness out of them. Yeah, they always had that thing in them, but they never really. And they had to learn how to train as a team. Oh yeah, and wasn't there a dog Steve? I. I think so. There was, it definitely wasn't Cat Wolf. It, it was, was some kind of dog. It was weird to me because it's like we've seen it done not Steve before, but like throughout media. You know, we had the whole Deadpool universe shenanigans, like all the Deadpool variants. Yeah, Deadpool core, yeah. Yeah, we've done the uh, the Reeds Council of Reeds, and then the Council of Ricks, mm-hmm. Rick and Morty. So, so like your like, version of that concept, yeah. Yeah, so like uh, it's weird to say something feels overplayed like that, but like when they did it with Steve, I was like, well, I kind of like this, and I don't like this at the same time. I don't like it because I'm tired of this idea. But I like it because I guess if you're going to do it to a character and it's going to feel fresh, it would be Steve Rogers. I think the most interesting part out of it, they kind of have them sequestered in their own little training place. And it's not necessarily, they're not telling them they're being trained, but they're kind of telling them they're being trained. They're like, they have an insurmountable goal to get over and they have to work as a team to do it and eventually do. And you're like, Oh wow. Who's really putting, who's pushing them. Who's putting them through their, their paces to do this. And it's six, one, six, Steve. Yeah. Like he's doing something that you wouldn't normally think him to do, which would be kind of be a dick to these guys that need it. Yeah. Not being as supportive as he normally would. 
so that was the striking oh shit this is this is super duper serious and it gets super duper serious the fourth thing that was interesting about it to me was the the multiversal masters of evil yeah uh anytime you do amalgamations of villains especially it's pretty interesting to me uh red skull with the symbiote oh killmonger in the destroyer armor green goblin plus ghost rider uh that was young a, thanos that was a cool design yeah throwing skull bombs yeah it was a great look uh Tween Thanos, not even tween, prepubescent Thanos, who might have been a little more twisted than grown-up Thanos because he was really enjoying himself. He wasn't at that been there, done it all phase. He's he's still liking, dissecting things. Yeah, it was it was borderline like touching himself when he was fucking yeah. things up. He was way too into it. All being led by the ultimate Doctor Doom. And that the the doom elements were pretty fun too because there's a point where the the most powerful version of doom captures another doom and torments him forcing him to to succumb to his will and all dooms are arrogant all dooms think they're the most powerful doom they're rick they're rick sanchez they all think they're the coolest guy in the room yeah so for a doom to break a doom says something there was uh, not that we're going to really talk too much about the FF books, but I read one a few weeks back where it was the the whole Baxter building issue, and then they go the fuck off to, mm-hmm. to Ben. The Doom time traveling thing? Yes. Yeah. And incredible. Yeah. The arrogance of Doom that he's never wrong. It's, it's not me. Even when he's interacting himself. Yeah. Richards did this, and that's yeah. why I can't fix this. Yeah. There's no way that Richards could best me, but somehow he figured out a way to best me, but that's impossible because no one else... Like, he he fucks up so bad that he has to go back into... He has to go back in time a few times and try and fix it, and never can. And <laughs> a, realizes, a few dozen times. Yeah. Realizes, oh shit, I never should have done this to begin with, so I have to go back in time stop myself from ever starting this cycle in a way that I don't know I'm the one doing it. So if you followed that sentence, folks, good on you. It was hard enough to read. It really was. But like, it was... We've been trained by time travel stuff. It was so, like, beautiful? Yeah. Beautifully convoluted. Yeah. And he does... Future Doom does it so well to himself that's like a few days younger yeah. that the younger doom can't believe that Richards figured out how to do it. So he kind of drives himself a little crazy. Yeah. So crazy. that he's like, you know what? I got to back the fuck off. Yeah. I just got to walk away from this. It was, it was really, it was probably one of my favorite issues of, of the things I've read in the last couple of weeks. Uh, FF, when you get to the most recent issue does something that's almost jump the sharky. Mm-hmm. Uh, dinosaur world. No. But it's not just like, oh, they go to a world that's still in, like, the Cretaceous or whatever. No, it's it's a world where dinosaurs evolved into modern society. And there's Dino Avengers. Ooh, okay. And the Dino Avengers fight the normal FF. <clears throat> and that's all I could say. And the other thing I could say, not to give too much away... Unlike most of these FF stories that have been single issue wrap ups, this one's got a second part coming up oh, yeah? because it ends in a, it ends in a oh shit moment. That's like not the most oh shit moment, but you're like, yeah, this kind of had to happen. This is the kind of if you're gonna do dinosaur superheroes, you need a really cool dinosaur supervillain to show up. Oh, nice. Yeah. So that's about all the FF you're gonna get. Uh, Avengers Forever. Like I was saying. It, was, it just becomes... It was kind of like... We talked about this the last time we did issues. Uh, was it... Oh, not not Powers of X. It was that big the big battle where the X-Men had to do that tournament. That, that, wasn't, that, wasn't that Powers? Was that Powers? I don't remember anymore. Because it was... Yeah, it was power, I think it was Powers of, powers of 10. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was... Originally it was House of X and... 
I don't even remember anymore. They're using so many. Sim- anyway, <laughs> it had X in it. it. It always had an X in it, and it definitely involved powers. Because that thing was supposed to be a tournament, but it eventually just evolves or devolves into a giant battle where we can't win. And then the cavalry shows up, and the cavalry is just a whole bunch of fucking like the Avengers and stuff. Like everyone just shows up, yeah. and it's a massive throwdown just to save all of reality. Where this one kind of becomes that same thing, where it's it's a massive battle, and there's no way we can overcome this. And that giant celestial mountain that Justin was talking about before that used to be their headquarters turns into a death lock because cool. I was just rereading that. They uh, there's, ordered that shit. There's a, a doom that's the size of a planet, so it's basically eco doom. There's hundreds and hundreds of dooms at prime doom's disposal, so it just becomes just a nasty monstrous battle and all of this was propagated on another bunch of variants on mephisto if you, if you watch the mcu yeah. stuff you don't really know who mephisto is yet he's essentially the devil but not completely the devil isn't he isn't he his kid uh i i don't know what the lore is at this point uh, he is the ruler of a dimension right of a hell-like dimension who's got uh varying powers he can alter reality and stuff like that. It's one of those guys who should be so powerful you shouldn't stop him, but for some fucking reason they're always able to, and it doesn't always make sense. He's like his own worst enemy kind of guy. Yeah. And they seeded this a while yeah. before. Yeah. When they dumped Tony in the past. Yeah. And, and he, started, Iron Man. he started going fucking mad. Yeah, yeah. and had to create like stone armor or some shit. He had to create yeah. caveman armor. And the whole time he's getting fucked with by a snake and it's Mephisto. But he's like, you know, I know it's you and I know you're fucking with me. Yeah. I know you're showing my father Howard and they retcon some shit where Howard isn't his biological father. He adopted him because he knew he was going to be a genius and Howard was evil. Didn't love that part. There's... I was not happy with that whole thing. Yeah, I can stand a retcon when it makes sense and, and adds in a good slash positive way. This one kind of felt like a reach. And that ended up, Mephisto ended up like Taking Vegas, right? Well, I think he brought Vegas back from nothingness. Because let's not forget, during the Secret Empire story where Hydra yeah. Steve was running shit, he just obliterated Vegas from space. So Mephisto did one of those, which was kind of an interesting thing. He did one of those evil deals where I'll bring back Vegas, but I run it. Or I he, he had... Uh, a lot of influence in the town, and he had one casino at the very least. I don't know if he was running the whole show, but it was a deal with the devil that should have not happened. Eventually, he got his, of course. The whole point of the Avengers Forever deal was Mephisto attempting to die. There's a shit ton of Mephisto variants, too. Yeah. Every different look under the sun. And he was trying to unleash this power from underneath the god quarry just to kill himself because nothing else could, essentially. He's, his existence is torment, so he wants all existence to end, which is kind of a trope at this point. It's been done before, but it's not done a lot. Yeah, it's one of the things that, like, <clears throat> Marvel Marvel likes to recycle the same kind of big storylines for each of their big books and only tweak certain things. Well, does that come back to there's only so many types of stories and if you want to make it something huge and gigantic and personal at the same time, you've got to make it an epic battle but then pull it back down to what does the villain really... What can an yeah. unstoppable villain really want? Yeah, I think the problem is, is at this point there's no new unstoppable villain and you kind of stuck with the same guys. So there's only so many times that like they become credible like, you know, if a, a true threat. Yeah. And what is the threat anyway? But so to make it like I'm sick of existence, eternity sucks. I want to die, and the only way they can do that is to end all of existence. Yeah. It, you can understand that if you were stuck in an infinite loop, 
you'd do anything eventually. Like at first we all have our morals, we all have our ethics. We're like, no, I'd never do that to the rest of existence. But then after a while you're like, fuck everyone else. I want this to end. If I can never win the way I want to, everyone's gotta lose for me to get some peace. Right. Not the worst story tool. But it's a weird reveal at the, after the end of this giant epic battle that he he never really wanted to win anything other than to lose. Which in and of itself is just odd. Yeah. Uh, another oddity, as we said before, a prime who was the guy, uh, essentially the man on the tower making sure the god Cory never gets destroyed. Yeah. They're teasing Avenger Prime for a while. They like, go, oh, who could he be? Who could he be? Who could he be? It was a Loki. Yeah. I, uh... I remember when I, like, had that spoiled. This is like, huh. I wonder how that's going to play out. Yeah. I... It's obviously a choice made because at the time the Loki series was out, which I'm pretty sure they were in the middle of it, and it's one of those synergy decisions... But it's not a bad one. Especially what they're doing with Loki at this point in his show. This variant, this version of him, has come to grips with the fact that he doesn't have to be a bad guy. He doesn't have to hurt people. Which the other Loki that got all the way to Infinity War kind of realized. Yeah. It, it's, it's a reality of Loki. Once he gets over himself, he can do the right thing. But he's in his own little Ragnarok because... He uh, gets reborn sometimes and forgets that and just goes mischievous and just kills fuckers. This Loki seemed to just really, really latch on to the, I have glorious purpose and my glorious purpose is protecting all of reality. He's just staying in this place with his own little eye of Agamotto and protecting reality and being his own type of smug about it. So it fit in some ways. Not the worst Avengers crossover ever, but it just got so big and overblown and financially a killer. If you wanted to follow every part of it, it was not a cheap run to mm. follow. I, I do appreciate a nice six-issue miniseries that's got high stakes and ends in half a year. That was not this. And it's, it was also not anything that's happened in Spider-Man recently. Yeah. I've kind of enjoyed that Spider-Man hasn't had anything, like, too insane. I mean, because it's, it's interesting to handle just the background stuff with Norman coming out of uh, the Sin Eater shit. And, like, the whole Golden Goblin thing and... Like, that's still a weird adjustment, and I just keep waiting with every issue for the fucking shoe to drop. Uh, well, I can tell you this. The laces are being untied. Okay. It had to have happened, like, eventually. It's coming. And it's coming hard. The most recent issue, uh, some shit went down where, uh, there's, there's definitely cracks in the armor. Okay. He's not going full goblin yet, but it's, there's only so long. Yeah. There's only so long before you bring that character back. And I said it before, I think I've even said it in this episode, I love a redemption story, but unfortunately for someone like that, and in the comic world where, as Mark Bernardin said many times, there's no third act. Yeah. It's all second act. Eventually he's got to go evil again. And it's, if you think about the way Defoe played him, as the way I'm trying to apply to it in the comics, when he's Norman, often, he regrets everything he's done. Yeah. But when he's Goblin, he's nothing but avarice. He's, he's just pure, unbridled will. Yeah. Uh, we could touch on the period where Peter wasn't Spider, where Ben was Spider-Man. That was, that was interesting. Yeah. It's another one of those, you know it's not going to last forever, but it's it's good because Ben's life, as bad as Peter's is, 
Benz has always been worse. Yeah. And it just keeps getting worse. He finally finds someone he's in love with. And of course he falls in love with a woman who's got a criminal past. Right. Who's got to stay locked up in a tower. She's in a gilded cage that they both have to accept. And it just keeps getting worse and worse. And the company he decides to work with, this multinational conglomerate of evil, is screwing with his memories. Yeah. That... There was there was one issue where he go. I can't remember the name of that company. It wasn't Oblivion, right? It was. It started with an O. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Where someone has to go through one of their facilities, and it's just the like a talking sandwich shows up at one point. Yeah. That kind of weird uh, absurdity shit. They're doing odd experiments that they can barely control and it comes to bite them in the ass eventually uh that whole storyline of ben taking over ben riley taking over the role of spider-man came to be because peter was at this with that ground zero of a nuclear explosion or some kind of radioactive explosion and it took its toll on you know because he's got radiation in him anyway they can write it in that he can survive it but he was laid low for a while and as he was laid low, Mary Jane was at his side the entire time. Yeah. So you're like, oh shit, they're getting back together. And then, oh shit, they tear him apart. It, yeah. That's that's my other issue with Spider Man. Like, I know it's the character, and I know it's the whole Parker, well, cursed shit, but like. My man, just when he catches a break, like, expect three issues later that everything's going to go to absolute fucking shit. Mm-hmm. It, and it's not like he didn't have a time with her a long time where they had moments of happiness, they had tribulations and whatnot. It was always tricky to stay married to her and do right by her. But, like, it worked. It, we were happy with it as fans. And I don't even piss and moan about one more day. I thought it was an interesting idea yeah. to, to tear them apart, but let's get them back together. And right now, they are so far apart emotionally. They interact with each other a lot, but like she's got a husband and two kids from an alternate dimension. They'd have to do some really fucked up shit to them to get them out of her life. They will. They will. I'm calling it, they send them back to that dimension. She doesn't go with them. They're forced to go back. So she's got to deal with for like a year yeah. the fact that she lost her family. And eventually something's going to happen that pulls them back together. Well, she's a superhero now. She's got fucking... Yeah, I know. No powers. Yeah. Well, she, she had the gig uh, working with Stark for a while. Mm. He didn't... The, her, her new husband, Dan? Is he the one who got her, though? He made it for her in that alternate dimension it's it's something about that dimension where symbols in a certain order have power and that carried over when this crazy demigod tried to show up As they and, do. and killed Miss Marvel for five minutes <laughs> that shit <laughs> oh my god she's dead oh my god she's back Oh my god, she's a mutant, and she's like the last one they're going to bring back to life. We'll, we'll get into that a little later. It was Beyond. I was wrong. It wasn't. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. It was Beyond Corporation. And they were probably as evil as Alchemex and Roxxon put together. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that, that whole story led into it's the finale of the whole Beyond story had Peter finally getting back on his feet, yeah. taking the mantle again, but Ben falling into a puddle of some kind of uh, transformative goo and giving him new, wacky, interdimensional powers, it would seem. Another undefined ability spectrum that a character gets. <laughs> just so that Ben Riley became the Spider-Verse. Yeah. 
he he had like energy webbing that would come out of him at great costume though really yeah, yeah, it's cool 2099-esque costume and he became chasm i believe was his name and that led into the dark web storyline where we had a nice little crossover between the x-men and spider-man because uh madeline pryor we all know if you guys are in on the know <laughs> oh is the clone of jean gray that's had a pretty horrible existence in her own right. Yes, she, chasm. Much like Ben, it 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 sucks to have clones of you in the Marvel universe, but it she, sucks even worse to be a clone. She uh, yeah, she didn't have it easy, but she's a she's a couple fries short of a fucking Happy Meal. L- literally, she yeah. didn't have memories that would much yeah. like Ben. That was the that was the big problem. Beyond screwed with Ben's mind and took memories, so. He, it's a couple of great issues where as he was going around, he couldn't see people's faces as he was talking to them. They were basically like just black masks. Yeah. You know, you could see it was the eyes. So that, along with the fact that he didn't have memories, core Peter Parker memories to, to keep him decent, was driving him batshit crazy. So when you get a batshit crazy clone with creepy sci-fi powers and a batshit crazy clone that's got creepy hell dimension powers because Madeline Pryor is and has been for a while the queen of limbo yeah limbo is a very dangerous reality in and of itself a dangerous uh, dimension it's a hell apparently there's a lot of hells in the Marvel Universe multiple multiple hells yeah and this one's hellishly helly and it's the second inferno. I don't, remember, I don't know if you guys were ever reading comics back in the day. This isn't the first time Madeline Pryor pulled elements of limbo into the 616 proper, but she did it again and turned New York into a uh, little shop of horrors. Well, to be fair, yeah. it is like a small section of it. A, a part of Manhattan. Yeah. A lot of Manhattan. Yeah. And it had one of those resolutions that could have been handled earlier if the heroes were if well if one of the heroes wasn't being so stingy in a lot of ways but it yeah. does come back to you shouldn't start a war if all you really want is help from someone all madeline wanted was memories so she should have yeah. just gone to gene and been like hey can, can you let me in on what the fuck happened with my my child Madeline Pryor was the biological mother. She gave birth to Nathan Summers, who was pulled into the future and became Cable. So, not only didn't she have the memories of giving birth to him anymore, she didn't have the memories of raising him, which Jean did. Now, that's a whole fucking side story where they time travel and and pull into a different body and her and Cyclops raised him in the future, so he actually got to see his... uh, That was more Marvel craziness. Yeah. In the late 90s. That's all she wanted. Just a little bit of info. And the whole thing fucking ended with Gene being like, oh, you just want those memories, right? Uh, There there they are. And a lot less demon chairs. A lot less crazy post boxes. Yo. The demon Cerebro is pretty sweet, though. Yeah. But, uh... Ben didn't get what he wanted out of that deal, so no. he, he remained very pissed. We did get a new kind of superhero out of it, if you consider Rec Rap a hero. No. You don't? No. <laughs> so there was a little tiny um, thumb-sized demon, you might call him, that was getting picked on by a lot of the other larger demons, and they snatched a piece of the Venom symbiote. Yeah. And did all types of magic to it and slapped it on this demon and he got all huge. He got all venomy huge, but in, in classic kind of bizarro fashion, when something weak from an evil place gets abilities, it isn't evil. It tries to be good. Yeah. And he's a bizarro Spider-Man Yeah. who finds out Peter's name is Parker and thinks it's got a name itself. Wreck rap. Yeah. Because reasons. Because logic. Yeah. And he's popped up again recently. I don't know if you, you read that. He's He might think, actually be in the 616. No, really? 
he might be a full-time character. Yes. He seems to have gone over with people. I guess. I don't know. I was I'm still sitting that fence. Is it It's X time? I believe it's X time because uh, that was a highlight, you could say. Well, the, the finale of all this, which is one of the things leading into X time, is uh, Madeline's got her, her memories back, mm-hmm. and there is an embassy for Limbo in New York City. Yes. With, a tower. With fucking havoc of all people. Yeah. Uh, it, if there was ever an X-Man, and there are very many X-People who don't exactly have a compass to, to point them <laughs> true. It's Havoc. It's in the he's, name. He's a sad little man in a lot of ways. You feel bad for him. Right? Very bad. He's very, he's very Pravdo. Scott Summers throws a big shadow, even after he's become a mutant terrorist. Yeah. Well... Some could say that makes the shadow that much bigger. Alex as the younger brother. That's right, people who only know these characters from the movies. Alex is the younger brother of Scott Summers. So he's always being compared to the greatest X-Men leader ever. Yeah. And he's always searching for his direction. And he's never finding the right one. And I can't help but feel like he's and it's in this not, spot. it's not from a lack of trying, either. It's always trying. Always. But, you could say his best time was leading X Factor. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that got taken away like like everything else good. Yeah. He uh he decides to stay with Madeline, uh the ex wife of his brother, very uh Freudian, I guess you could say, as her consort, as her uh uh, first man who, who even knows what his official title is assistant I, I mean I. it feels like he's running all the shit uh, he's, he's I think he's supposed to be running the field team shit but he did a pretty horrendous job on their first mission yeah 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 he got his throat straight up sliced and almost died yeah and in the state the X Men are in, which is what we're about to get into. Well, no X Men ever stays dead for long. No. But for the past few years, it was really easy for them to not stay dead. The Krakoan Age, I find to be one of the most interesting eras in storytelling since since the Dark Reign. The Dark Reign was back when Norman Osborn was in charge of Shield, turned it into Hammer. And all the heroes were running for their lives. That was a very interesting story time. Very, they were trying some weird shit there. You don't often see the bad guys in control. Whereas Krakoa was... Xavier and Magneto got together and didn't try and take over the world. Just tried to get their own little pocket of it. Made an island utopia where every mutant was welcome. And... They had more than enough clout to hold their own. They created a whole bunch of drugs and stuff to help the world. They did nothing but humanitarian stuff uh, in the public view. Every other decision they made was clandestine at best. Uh, uh, what's, the, what's the nicest way to say self-destructive? Self-destructive. Yeah, that's their deal. Mm-hmm. Parker's got bad luck. The Avengers break up more than like a high school romance. And the X-Men, for all their trying, really shit the bed all the time. Mm-hmm. Lofty goals and poor decisions along the way. Wait, uh, to, to, make, to try and make a mutant utopia... It's a bad enough decision to bring Apocalypse in there. But, like, he's... He may be... He may have been introduced as a villain, but he was an individual with with an ethos. 
much like you said in the Big Lebowski, say what you will about Nazis, say what you will about say what you will about <laughs> national socialism, but at least it's an ethos. Sure. Yeah, much like uh, much like Uve in Logjamming, Mister Sinister is a nihilist. Yeah. You don't bring Mister Sinister in, not just into your company, not into your country. You don't bring him into your inner circle and not expect something bad to go down. Yeah, this was I. I said this to you the other day when we were just talking about comics. I said I, out of all the people that they chose to like have involved. In the council for Krakoa. Why? Yeah, that was the deal with the devil kind of thing. Because if you remember the beginning, the creation of Krakoa, they didn't have the technology to bring back everyone. They knew they could. They had the tools to to uh, bring back anyone they wanted to. To resurrect any mutant ever. Right. Well, any any mutant after a certain period. Right. They knew they could do that, but they didn't have all the tools they needed to get it done. They had enough, so they needed to go to him for the genetic aspect of it, which is uh, risky at best. But you know, if you're writing a story, you gotta you gotta create a villain. When you've turned all your villains into allies, you need to see the villain in there somewhere. And he was he was a time bomb waiting to happen. And when it exploded, it exploded in very interesting ways uh, by identifying a mutant whose ability is anytime they die, they reset time and cloning them mm -hmm. and creating a bunch of uh, parameters to use that ability to your advantage. That was a fucked up issue where Sinister is just trying different things, different ways to kill Hope and Exodus, and failing over and over again. Just so he could start his his grand plan, which had really already been put in place in a lot of ways. Any mutant who had been resurrected had a little bit of sinister gene in them. Yeah. So, at a certain point, he just kick it in, and everybody's a little bit sinister. Uh, it was... It is so, like, grand level villain that when it all started playing out, I was like, of course. Duh. Did they not see something like this coming? Yeah. And, and they're writing them, too, like, oh, we gotta watch out for this guy. He's gonna pull something. Yeah. He's gonna pull something. Of course, fucking course, he's gonna pull something. Why'd you make a deal with this devil? Yeah. Like, after, after you used him for what you needed him for, you absolutely should have turned and locked the motherfucker up. Yeah. But it's the weakness of good. It's, Heroes stick to their word. It's not just the weakness of good, it's the stupidity of Xavier at certain points. Mm -hmm. he, yeah. he believes too much sometimes that mutant kind can come together for mutant kind. No, you're just like humans, like, you have faults, and, like, he's a bad dude. Yeah, I, I think that's something that someone needs to write in an X book eventually. Like, they call themselves the next evolution, they're basically gods in physical form. No, you're people with powers. Yeah. You're fucked up people with powers. But he, like, they can Yeah, because it's the same way with the gods in the MCU, right? Yeah. Like, all the familial bullshit that Thor has been through and uh, Hercules and all and those motherfuckers like it's just you know like you should all see all the pantheons are fucked up yeah everybody everybody's fucked no yeah. one's perfect and like I get it I understand he you know that's been his dream is just this is it they finally you know they made Krakoa it's a nation for the mutants all the new mutants are together Everybody's having naked parties when they get, get rebirth. Like it's a good time. But, it's but, Zion. It's dance yeah. party Zion. Often. Right. And like, you know, you, you help out, and you're like, we don't expect anything from everybody. 
Listen, Miss Marvel, we resurrected you. Because. You're one of us now. Google Gobble. The only thing I didn't like, and I don't know if it gets, like, any further down the road, because I haven't hit it yet, but do her mutant abilities, like, reveal themselves? Or no? No. No. Okay. No. Uh, one of the most recent issues that I've dropped off this past weekend, they bring it up. They're like, we don't know when it's going to kick in, but it, it will eventually. And it seems, to me, I'm pretty sure it's going to be something fairly similar to her ability in the MCU. I, yeah. Oh, the energy projection shit? Yeah. Just to make it, make a parallel between the two. The whole synergy thing. Yeah. That's how corporations think. Yeah, which is why they're, they're, they did what they did and they're ending Krakoa. Mm-hmm. Because they need to bring them back to their roots in order for the MCU shit to, to level off with them. Yeah. Oh, X-Men. Yeah. It, it was one of those things, I, I enjoy the hell out of it, and I picked up a handful of the different series. Uh, I picked up a lot of the Fall of, Fall of X. Not yeah. Fall, the Sins of Sinister. Yeah. Which was a little pocket universe. Like we were saying, Sinister enacted his plan. A vast majority of the, the mutants on Krakoa were now Sinisters. But that's where the stupidity of evil comes in. Because just because you've inserted part of your personality into these other characters doesn't mean, especially doesn't mean, that they're going to work with you. Because you're a duplicitous douchebag. Uh You only care about yourself. So what it created was different powerful factions that thought they were the most important Mr. Sinister. And it went on for literally a thousand years. Yeah. It destroyed the entire universe. To the point that Mr. Sinister decided, oh shit, I fucked up. I gotta become a hero and stop what I did. And the the Moira engine, as I was saying before, there was one mutant whose death could reset all of time. Yeah. Back to a certain point. That was Moira McTaggart. If you remember the character from the uh, first class movie who wasn't a mutant, turns out she was. Turns out that was her ability. Turns out she was really pissed that... Uh, that she was she a was, mutant. Not that she was a mutant, that she was uh, she was kept away from everyone. Because as soon as Krakoa was created, that this was uh, this was a bomb that was ready to go off that was even bigger than just Sinister being involved. Moira was involved with the very creation of Krakoa and wasn't allowed to be part of it. Yeah. Because two other very important mutants, Mystique and her wife, uh, Destiny, needed to not know Moira was alive. Needed to not know that she was a mutant. Needed to not know a lot of stuff, because if they did, they could reveal way too much. It was very, very convoluted, very in and outy. But Moira had to stay tucked away in some place that they couldn't even use their mutant abilities to find her. And it started to piss her off. It started to get her a well, little... Until they crazy. did. Until they did. Yeah. And I believe killed her? Yes. So she was the saving grace for the Sins of Sinister story. A thousand years in the future when there was only... The only surviving X-Man was Storm. And it was just a bunch of bunch of wacky fucking chimeras that different versions of Sinister kept creating. That's the most interesting part for me. The most creative shit they did out of all of it. And there was a lot of creativity all around, but creating hybrids of different mutant powers and seeing how they could play off of each other. Yeah. Like Rasputin 4 is the only character to survive this pocket universe. And she's a combination of Xavier, Kitty Pride, Colossus, and Quentin Quire. Yeah. I think there's one more question mark in there, and I'm not sure who it is. But she's a badass. Yeah. And she doesn't have a lot of social skills. Not even a little. No. And that becomes... You haven't you haven't read the issue where they interact with the Fantastic Four yet. Uh, that's post-Gala? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, well, yeah, I, I just dropped it off. Okay. Yeah, yeah no. Well, not yet. Her and Ben aren't friends. <laughs> they probably will never be friends. Uh, she's strong. Let's just say she's very strong. 
Uh, so that whole Sins of Sinister thing happened right before the most recent Hellfire Gala. Yeah. And, you know, mutants have always had enemies in humanity. And when you create your own island nation of mutants, all those enemies are going to come together. And when they're very smart and very well funded and very motivated, you got a very nasty enemy. And that's who Orcus is. Yeah. And they've been a very scary antagonist. If you care about these characters, even though they're immortal, they were immortal essentially. They were. Cause they, they were. Because Orcus is effective. Yeah. Orcus really, scattered them to the wind. Really effective. Yeah. Disturbingly. <clears throat> and in one night, they, uh, they took apart the X-Men. E- like, easily. Yeah. Piece by piece, them. Uh, almost decimated the Avengers. Beat the shit out of Captain America. Like, pinpointed everyone to put them in their place. Yeah. And now have mutants on the run. And one of my favorite parts out of all of this, you know, it's sad to watch characters that you enjoy going through a negative period, but killer assassin shadow cat. Yeah. Just her taking that name. It's always been my favorite Kitty pride name. She's gone through a lot of them. She was captain Kate pride of the SS Marauder. Yeah. During Krakoa. She was Sprite for a while. She was just Kitty, but shadow cat is the name she had when I came into comics and it's always been the perfect name for her, I think. And now that she's a dual sword wielding ninja killer fucking death machine. Yeah. I'm, my I'm, favorite version of her. I always loved Kitty Pride as a character. Yeah, so much potential. Brilliant. Uh, and interesting power set. Yeah. And trained by Wolverine and Wolverine's mentor. Yeah. She is capable. And she's extra capable in the stuff. How, did you read the issue where she uh, she goes in and almost saves Juggernaut? I think I just dropped that one off. You probably didn't get to that yet. Yeah, I think it's coming up in the the stuff you just brought me. Yeah. There's there's so many weird, crazy ass things coming out of it. Like Firestar was one of uh, Spider Man's amazing friends. Yeah. She was she was the the fire character on that cartoon. She was a mutant and she became a member of the X-Men. They've just voted her in, I believe at the gala before shit went to complete shit. And she, in order to get someone in Orcus that could help them, Jean Grey in her dying breath inserted memories into one of the Orcus members that Firestar was a turncoat. Yeah. So now all of the X-Men that know about it are out to kill her. But she's got to play a double agent and avoid said uh, killings, which is a big problem when someone who could walk through walls and was trained by some of the deadliest people in the Marvel Universe, like a lecture that you can't touch, is yeah. essentially what yes. they probably you know, It's coming after you. Very interesting times. That's pretty much where that stands. The only thing that I kind of regret not picking up in my entire age of Krakoa, I just haven't gotten a Wolverine. But I've kept my ear to the ground on what's going on there. And we've been saying it for a while. Uh, Hank McCoy is a, is a bigger problem than Reed Richards. He's a menace. Yes. Uh, he, he was always on the edge of bad science of of reckless science being in his own nation state just allowed him to go fucking nutty yeah he i believe he cre- he created a bioweapon and unleashed it on a country almost destroyed it and when he saved it used that as leverage for Krakoa so they had that hanging over their heads that you could find out that the world could find out that they almost let an entire bioweapon destroy the world Oh, and he cloned a bunch of Wolverines and used them as his assault team. That's Yeah, mindless Wolverines. So it's not like there's a bunch of Logan's personalities out there. No, just kind of feral monsters. But they, they all wear the brown outfit, so you can... They, they're well-appointed. Well, that's nice. Monsters, yeah. Which kind of pissed off 
Core Logan, like, had enough stuff done to his name over the years. He's, Beast is a, Beast is a character that I hope as the Krakoa saga winds down, they turn into, like, a full-scale supervillain. And not just for the X-Men. Like, for everyone. Yeah. If you want to, if you want to refresh, like your books and have a fucking Omega level intelligent Reed-esque disaster that's what you do because he's a problem yeah his shenanigans have almost destroyed the universe many a time let's not forget when he went back in the past and borderline kidnapped himself and his four founding teammates brought them to the to the modern age yeah. and almost completely fucked up the time stream. Yeah. Oh, Hank. Oh, Hanky Panky. All right. I need sleep now. I think we're, yes, I think we're good. Uh, this is what Marvel has going on. Uh, if you folks out there know some cool DC stuff, that's good for you. Yeah. Make my- Maybe I'll try to get some DC stuff for the next time we do this. The show probably is going to become more uh, frequent, right? Yeah, it would be it would be nice for it to be more fresh in our minds too, and we could we could focus on one book a little better, one one yeah, arc. Because I think we're going to start doing this as a video series, right? This is kind of what we were throwing around the other day. Yeah. So look forward to that, kids. We'll be talking yeah. comics more often. Maybe even lift some up, show them to the camera, show our favorite shots. Yeah. Yeah. It's a new age of nerdies, much like uh, Krakoa. Yes. As Krakoa falls, nerdy rises. Yeah. It's the Mike and Justin takeover. Mm-hmm. Issues. We all have them. And now you do too. Mm-hmm. And the opinions of the nerdies crew are filled with comic stuff. Yeah. So, uh, you know what to like and follow, so do that. Yeah. It's N E R D A T I E S. Just put that in pretty much anywhere. Yeah. We have a lock on that word. That's us, baby. Mm-hmm. Alright, fuck bye. Fuck bye. And why should I care? Mmm, dry.